Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Look at the next one, verse 3. If I give all my possessions... Oh, I'm sorry. I, I skipped a part of verse 2. He said, if I, if I know all mysteries... All knowledge, I have the gift of prophecy. If I have all faith, now do you guys know that faith is actually a gift. What if you have all faith, he says, to remove mountains? Remember Jesus said, if you had a mustard seed worth, that's how much it takes. And one mustard, how big is a mustard seed? Small, so it's a little teeny. I remember buying my wife this little plastic, you get a laugh, it was a pendant. At the, at the Christian bookstore. It was a plastic little, looked like a bead, right? And inside of it, because it was round, it, it, it magnified so you could see the seed. And inside it had frozen in the little bead a, a mustard seed. Yeah, the, the, little, the little thing to magnify. She says a little round thing. It was a heart shape with a little mustard seed. In it. And I got her that little necklace and I was like, here's a mustard seed. This is all we need, Jesus said, to say to that mountain, get up and move. Don't do it, mountain. I'm just example. <laughs> We'd like you to stay there, that one. Cause I don't want whole ally just plopping over my shoulder. But, but if you had a mustard seed of faith and you spoke it would have, remember Jesus had that faith. He could say to the wind, to the seas, in the midst of a storm, be still. Do you think that he doubted whether the storm would stop? What happened as soon as he said those words? Poof, flat. What if Jesus would have said, get up to that mountain and move over there? Would it obey him? Sure would. See, this is the part he says, and if you had faith that much, just that much, he said, you could say, get up and move, and it would obey. But see, we don't, when I hear that, I'm like, Lord, help my faith. I must be operating on like a fraction of a mustard seed here. I, I believe that you can heal people. I believe that you can, you can cast out demons. I believe you can. I don't know about chucking that mountain into the sea. Have any of you thought about that? How many of you believe God could hear your prayer and help your friend who's sick? You pray for them, right? You go, oh, yeah, God can help them. No problem. We're good with that. That's like working on, what, a tenth of a mustard seed? <laughs> but I'm talking the whole seed now. If you had a whole seed worth of faith, you could say to a mountain, move, and it would obey you. How many have that much faith? The Bible says that's a gift of the Holy Ghost. One of the gifts is the gift of faith. Some people have a measure that is remarkable. I mean, they... If God says something to them, go do this, and it could make no sense at all in the natural, and they'll go, well, he said do it. I'm doing it. I believe him. And you're going, but you can't. It, 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 it. He said do it. I've had a few opportunities for God's spirit to work on a, maybe a fraction of a mustard seed in my life. Like, leave this, uh, when I was at Calvary Tri-City in Arizona with John Higgins, you go to the Big Island. And I was like, uh, but I don't have money. I don't have, you know, all the objections in the mind come up. Are you going to do what I say? Or are you going to stop because of what you see as the impossible? And, and I remember telling my wife, honey, the Lord told me we're going. I haven't even packed a box I haven't cleaned a thing, like, you know, even acted like I'm going. I mean, I know he said we're going, but I'm not really acting like it. I need to repent. We need to get ready. And she's like, but I don't want to go. Are you sure? And I'm like, but I know we're supposed to go. And when, and the whole time I didn't know if my wife was on board. She was like, oh, all right, were you, you know, out of respect. What you say, I'll follow, you know, kind of thing. She was doing the, was that Sarah and uh, Abraham or, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, where you go, I'll go. Ruth, remember the, the, the uh, yeah, okay, I'll do it. But when we were flying into Kona, after we didn't know how we were going to get here and the Lord supplied these tickets 
from America West, seven of them. At seven, I was like, okay, okay, Lord, I got the hint, we're going. And we, we flew in, and as we were landing in Kona, we look out the window, and she goes, oh, great. God's called us to the moon, because you know what it looks like when you're flying in, <laughs> and you see all that lava field, and it just looked like that, you know, it's great, God's called us to the moon. This is 26 years ago almost. July 4th to make 26 years ago. And when, when she said that, the weirdest thing was, all I heard was, God's called. Not God might have called, or maybe we're supposed to be. She knew. And I already knew before we were landing. I knew when we were, we need to pack our stuff and get ready. It's time to go. But that was, that was one of those measures of faith where God was increasing me. Maybe I was up to a quarter of a mustard seed that day. Like, okay, yeah, I know we're supposed to go. Just trust him. It doesn't make any sense. I mean, I'm working as a, oh, I know they call me associate pastor at this time. That was like a glorified title. It started off as youth leader, youth pastor, assistant pastor, associate pastor. This is eight years of time, okay? Somehow I got promotions during those eight years. I never knew about it. People would come up to me and go, hey, you're the assistant pastor. Can I ask you a question? I'm the assistant pastor. Why do you ask that? Why do you say that? It says on the back of the bulletin. Let me see one of those things. I don't read them anymore at that point, you know. <laughs> wow. I got promoted, I guess. I'm just doing the same job I did last week, and, and, and they changed my title on the back of the bulletin. And when I would talk to John Higgins about it, which, I, when did I get pr this change? He goes, when everyone started calling you the assistant pastor, he said, they know you by your what? Your fruit. He said, you, you have the fruit of an assistant pastor. You started as a youth leader, and then you had the fruit that exploded into the fruit that where everyone was. See, and he never put titles on, on the guys around him. And some guys hated that because they wanted a title. He wouldn't do it. He said, let God give the title. Let God give the calling, and we just confirm or acknowledge what God has done. Now, you know what? Honestly, that's a really safe way to do it because you don't wind up getting men's egos involved in, you know, this competition and race or give, give out titles before a guy is ready. Nothing worse than telling a young believer, hey, you should be the associate pastor. Really? I guess so. I am pretty good. God's going to need me helping that other guy. He's, you know, he's a little messed up. He even said it in his sermon last week. Good thing I'm on the team now. I've seen some young men in their faith just get poof, big head. Because someone gave him a title way too soon. And the problem is, there's a proverb about this. Pride goes before destruction. A haughty spirit before the what? A fall. You will, some of you know it as in the translation, pride goes before the fall. You get, you get puffed up and you just, you, you get in your nose like this. And what's the problem with this? You don't see even this right here. For those that can't see, there's a wire that runs to the speaker right there. Great way to get tripped up in life is get your eyes too too much up like this because your nose thinks I'm so good. Listen, you ever get used for this job, it's only because God has certain qualifications for men in the ministry. They're very specific. It says God has called what? The foolish things of the world to confound the wise. You meet a whole group, you hang out with a group of us pastors, you'll find out there's a whole bunch of qualified foolish guys. And, and I like it because I, 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 I think it was Pastor Mike even said this a few weeks ago. God doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the called. He doesn't need you to be qualified to use you because he can give you what you need to be used. And that's more of a testimony that there is a living God when people see, wow, he uses that guy. Can you believe it? When people from my high school find out I'm a pastor, I tell you the truth. The first thing I hear them say is, there's got to be a God. 
Izzy's a pastor. Did you guys hear? He's a pastor. There's, there has to be a God in heaven. There's no way. Now, some people could, you know, don't say that, Pastor. No, it's the truth. Without the living God, I would not do this calling. In fact, without God calling you to do this calling, I want to, I want to give you a little word of encouragement. Don't do it. You know, don't get suckered into, well, maybe you should be the pastor of our group. And you're going, but I don't, I don't feel God calling me. Don't, right? Is this true? How many guys have gotten called by men to be in the ministry, but not by God? Men appointed them. You do it. You be our leader. Push the guy to the front of the line. Here, you take over. God is the one that's supposed to call a man. And God gives these gifts so we can use them in conjunction with, we're just f with the flow, hopefully, of his spirit. We're in the flow that his spirit is directing. And when done with love, beautiful things happen. But without love, what's the end of verse 2 say? If I have faith so as to remove mountains, but I do not have love, I am how much? Zero. Nothing. Nada. Zilch. Zip. What? Any other way I could say that? Is that nine? Zero. You are nothing without love. If I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned as a, a martyr, but I do not have love, it profits me nothing. Paul says love is patient. Love is kind. It's not jealous. Love does not brag. It's not arrogant. It doesn't act unbecomingly. Some of you know this passage. It's one of the most famous passages of the whole Bible, 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 to 8. The love, the love description of God's love. God's love does not act unbecomingly. It doesn't seek its own. It is not provoked. It does not take into account a wrong suffered. Love does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but it rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And lastly, love never what? Never fails. This is true love. Okay, this is... and. For the ones that are in the courtship stage of their lives, you know, they're, they're going, I'm in love. I want to submit to you that you need to do a quick test. Is, is the love you're talking about this kind of love? Or is it a physical attraction of the flesh? Because that's not in love, that's in lust. We have a lot of in lust folks in our society. I'm in lust. You know, wooga, the eyes, you know, like in the cartoon, woo. That's lust, not love. Love is this. It's patient. It's kind. It is not jealous. This is one of those things that, you know, now some people say, if this is God's love, then I got a question for you, Pastor. This is, this is for my really Bible students. They'll be like, Ten Commandment time, Pastor. I'm like, I know where you're going. First commandment. I am the Lord your God. I am a what? Jealous God, and thou shalt have how many other gods before me? None. Zero. Zilch. Zip. Nine. None. No other gods before our God. He says he is a jealous God. Now that word, this is where the confusion that comes. They say, well, it says he's jealous, but then it says here love is not jealous. And you just told us this is God's love. I said, you're right. Both accounts, two different words, though. One's from the Greek and one is from the Hebrew. The one for God is a jealous God is a jealousy not in the sense of... When we're talking about this here in the Greek, love is, is not jealous. You know, like, the, have you ever met a jealous person where... They, in an unhealthy way, I mean an unhealthy jealousy. Someone talks to their, to their right, yeah, I'm going to kill you, get away. I was just going to give them um, some stuff to help them with the feeding, you know. Someone comes up to my wife, wants to, here, I want to donate this, and I'm like, get away from her. 
That's not healthy jealousy. The jealousy in the Hebrew when it says God is a jealous God is not in a selfish manner. God saying, I don't want you to have anyone else but me for because of I get insecure. There's nothing to do with that. The, the word in Hebrew says, where it says he is a jealous, he guards over you with jealousy, means it's a, it's a looking after you like, like how a parent looks after their child. You know, from my girls, I want the best for them. If some schmuck comes up, I have a Sicilian side. You do not want to mess with my daughters, young men, because I am jealous over them with that Hebrew, just like our Heavenly Father is jealous over us as His children, and He doesn't want anything for His children but the best. Just like I don't want anything for my daughters but the best. I want them to have the guy that's going to treat them correctly. It's going to do it right. Come up and try to treat my daughter incorrectly and you will find out what a jealous father can do. The Hebrew jealous one I'm telling you about. Now love not being jealous, this is, this is you have to apply this for you. This is, he's, when Paul's using the word he uses from the Greek, he's talking about that self-centered me, me, me. It's all about me. Not it's about the other person looking out for their best interests. He's talking about love not being jealous on the self-centered. Hey, it's all about me. I want it for me, 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 me. No. Love is for looking out for others. We went over last week, one of the gifts of the Spirit that God gives is that God helps us. Romans chapter 12, he said in verses 6 to, we'll go to the end of that chapter. One of the verses there says that we are to give preference to one another in honor. Put others in front of our own interests. Here, you go first. Our society doesn't do that. I mean, they don't even, I was raised in a day when they actually taught us to open the door for people. Like, you know, auntie's coming, she's got her arms full. You open the door, you let her go first. My son has followed his father's example. I've seen him open the door. And some of the ladies look, thank you. Wow, haven't seen that for a while. And from a young, and the, I can hear him as they're walking into the store. From a young man even. Did you see that young man open the door for us? Wow. You know, they're just blown. But honestly, as Christians, we should be marked by that kind of behavior. That we're always putting others before us. We're always letting them, here, you go first. Because we give preference to one another in honor. Just as, yeah, it's correct. It's part of what we should do in love. But see, this love that is being described, this love is looking out for those around. Not looking out for itself. Lust, on the other hand, lust, the easy comparison is lust has usually one focus. What's the focus? Self. Self-gratification. It's all about what I get out of the deal. Not what I give. True godly love is m about the giving. About taking care of the others. Lust is all about, it's all about me. I want this, I want that, I want that. Listen, when you give your life away and you take care of others, God has it wired where he'll take care of you. He'll, it, and he knows your needs. He knows your frame. You know, you guys know my wife was on the mainland with her father for the last couple of weeks. I was a sad Izzy. There's a verse that says, it is not good for man to be alone, right? I will make a helpmate suitable. And God did. He gave me a beautiful bride. When she's not with me, it feels like half of me is gone. And, and I just, like, I am not correct. Like, this is like the worst part of life. And so... When, when the guys go, but, but you looked happy today, Pastor. I'm like, I am. She's back. <laughs> you know, it's not, it's not a bad thing to say that in, in, our, in our 
designed by God. He made men where we're not actually complete without a helpmate. Right? I mean, I didn't make the design. God designed Adam, and he said, look, he made every animal, brought it before Adam, named them all. And if you read Genesis, you see, and it says, and it was still found is not good for man to be what? Alone. Those animals, you may say, but my dog is my be man's best friend. No. No. My wife is my best friend. And that, <coughs> God saw that as something we needed to complete us. Now for our lives as husbands, what do we have to do with our lives? We went over this a couple weeks ago. We have to lay down our lives for our wives. We have to nourish them, cherish them, love them like Christ loved the church. We are supposed to present them, this is my bride. No spot, no wrinkle, nor any such thing. You're supposed to, this is my perfect, look at this, this is my perfect bride. She's perfect for me. Now, I'm aware that other guys are going to find some other girl, the one that's perfect for them. And that's the beauty of it. The Lord knows which one fits which one. And if you seek the Lord, he can add that person. But you're going to spend the rest of your life, hopefully, giving and putting that other person, you ought to be giving them the preference. You should be opening the door for them. You should be taking care of their needs. You say, but then how will I get taken care of? Trust me on this. Does God know what he's talking about here, guys? You take care of your wives the way Christ tells you to. Don't worry, they'll take care of you. But see, the problem in our culture is they spun it. They're like, well, as soon as she gives me what I want, then I'll take care of her. <laughs> like some pouty little kid. I'm not giving till I get. You got it all backwards. You need to give. Don't worry about getting. It'll come. You're not doing it correct. You're not doing it. You're, that's, that's, that is the flesh crying, me, me, me. And that drive is all lust, not love. Stay to love. Love trumps lust any day. Love never fails. Never. Doesn't say, oh, but on occasion. No, this works all the time. You, it doesn't. It said right there. It doesn't. It, it it hopes all things, believes all things, bears all things, endures all things. Love. He said, no, love never gives up. That's right. It doesn't because it doesn't fail. Now, if there are gifts of prophecy, verse eight says, they'll be done away with. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is gifts of knowledge, they're going to pass away too. He says, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, you know, when Jesus comes again, am I going to need you to prophesy to me? They'll say it, though, I don't think so. Gift of prophecy will be done with as soon as Jesus reappears. That's it. When the perfect comes, the partial will be done away with. Paul says, when I was a child, I used to think as a child, reason as a child. But when I became a man, I did away with childish things. He said, now we see in the mirror dimly. But then we're going to see him face to face. Now we know in part. But then we shall be fully, will know fully just as also I have been fully known. There's going to be a day when we stand before the Lord. You know all those questions you had that you've been pondering. You've been like, I don't know. What about this? What about that? What's going As soon as you stand before the Lord, questions answered. I mean, I can't wait. You know, I always tell all the guys, if you want, you can get in line behind me because I'm not shy. I'm going to, I got a whole list. You know, Lord, what about this? What about that? What the, you know, some people are like, I hope someone else asks a question so I don't look stupid. I'll ask for you, okay? Just tell me your question. It's probably, I already thought of it, and I probably got it on my list. But guess what? When I see him, how much will I know? Answers done. I will know fully. But for right now, verse 13, 1 Corinthians 13, 13, until that day, we have three things that we just need to hang on to. But these things, he says now, faith, hope, and what's the last one? Love. 
Abide in these three. And which one is the greatest? Love. Love is the greatest. Now, abide means just remain. For right now, just stay in your faith. Stay in your hope. Stay in that love of God. I mean, let's, let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your holy scripture that gives us such, such encouraging words. Help us, Lord, to do as Paul wrote, to abide in faith and hope and love. And the greatest of these, love. Help us abide in your love all week long till we come back together again. We ask that in the name of your son, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone that agree with me said? Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? Let's sing a closing song and send you off in the joy of the Lord. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.